This is a Commitment 2022 special in partnership with the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. The Granite State Debates. The stakes are high in New Hampshire's U.S. Senate Republican primary this year. With a national push for the GOP to take back control of the Senate, the Granite State will likely see serious money and effort to flip this seat. Among the Republicans hoping to face Senator Maggie Hassan this November are a mix of familiar names and political newcomers. Retired Army General Don Boldick ran unsuccessfully in the Republican U.S. Senate primary in 2020. Then and now, he describes himself as anti-establishment and focused on the conservative grassroots. I want to assure any undecideds that Don Baldick is an outsider. He's not um, beholden to anybody, uh, and I've made sure of that. Bruce Fenton served in the Navy before becoming a financial advisor and making a timely investment in Bitcoin. A member of the Free State Movement, he would like to see dramatic reductions in the size of federal government. Everybody had to make cuts in the last two years, except government. I think it's time for them to make the cuts. They can, they, they can shave off a few percent of their budget so that basically the entire middle class could go tax-free for a few years. Businessman Vikram Mansharamani says the key to government spending is to do it wisely. The economist and author is new to Granite State politics, but says that gives him important perspective. A lot of conservative leaders think government spending is always bad. I don't think that's always the case. It can be good. We should seek investments that generate returns, not handouts. Chuck Morse is on the other end of the spectrum of political experience. The president of New Hampshire's state Senate, he was first elected to the state legislature in 1998. He owns a garden center in Atkinson and is known in Concord for cutting business taxes. I think it's pretty obvious why I'm running for our U.S. Senate. The Washington's a train wreck, and I honestly believe it's in need of New Hampshire common sense. Former Londonderry town manager Kevin Smith is also running on his record, pointing to economic development and budget surpluses during his time in that office. He also worked in state politics and ran for governor 10 years ago. He says that experience will make him an effective fighter for conservative values in Washington. We need to save America from the socialist policies that Hassan, Biden, and the Democrats uh, have been putting out there on everyone. You know, people are mad as hell. Tonight, the Republican candidates for U.S. Senate. Good evening and thank you for joining us for the Granite State Debates. I'm WMUR political director Adam Sexton. Tonight we'll hear from the Republican candidates for U.S. Senate. Five of those candidates are joining us tonight. They'll be answering questions from me and from our panelists. And those panelists tonight are WMUR anchors Gene Mackin and Steve Botari. Here's a look at the format. Each candidate will get up to 60 seconds to answer their questions, and they'll get up to 30 seconds for a rebuttal if necessary, and those will be granted at my discretion. Candidates will also be given 60 seconds at the end of an hour for the closing statement. We want to jump right into things, gentlemen, and so we're going to start with our first question from Steve Botari. Adam, thank you. Candidates, in the U.S. Senate, you have a choice. You can try to work across the aisle and move legislation, which leads to suspicion from the base that you're a Republican in name only, a rhino. Or you can fight partisan battles in the media, rake in the fundraising dollars, and become a major party player in your party politics. What kind of senator will you be? What are voters getting if they elect you? A partisan fighter or a deal maker? General Bolduc, to you first. Well, I'm an outsider and I've run on the fact that I will be a fighter in Washington, D.C., but that doesn't mean that you can't work together to get things done for Granite Staters. And the things that Granite Staters want done is they want low inflation. They want control of out-of-control spending. Maggie Hassan has spent $5.1 trillion since March of 2021. It's wasteful, we don't have it, and it's hurting Granite Staters. They want a strong country, borders and a strong foreign policy. They're afraid for their children. They're afraid for their grandchildren. And their livelihood right now is under attack. So I will go down there and fight for those things. And you're either with me or you're not with me in the United States Senate. And that's the message that I'll deliver to all the senators and all the Congress persons down in Washington, D.C. I will be the ambassador for the state of New Hampshire. Senator Morse, to you next. Yes, I, I think I've proven that I can do it here in New Hampshire working across party lines with people that believe in the same ideals that I have. 
I did it in 2015. I said we needed to cut business taxes in New Hampshire to grow the economy and be able to solve bu our budget problems, and that's what I did. Maggie Hassan, she chose to veto that budget. And I worked all summer long to make sure that Republicans and Democrats and independents saw the other side of this. They saw we could grow an economy here in New Hampshire by cutting business taxes. And we overrode Maggie Hassan's veto, and it was for the benefit of New Hampshire. Look, we're the envy of the nation right now, right here in New Hampshire, with the way we grew this economy. Mr. Smith, to you, same question. Yeah, look, I have a long track record of being both a conservative fighter, but a fixer as well, someone who gets results. You know, as the town manager of Londonderry for the last decade, we were one of the most successful communities in the state for economic development. We lowered taxes in Londonderry. Same thing over at Pease, where I was the chairman of the board there. We expanded businesses on the trade port. But as I said, I have a record of being a conservative fighter too. I served in the legislature. I have a conservative voting record. I was named the pro-life house member of the year in 1997. And when I'm talking to people out on the campaign trail, they're talking to me about all the issues that Maggie Hassan is not addressing right now and the issues that I will fight for. It's the price of home heating oil, the high skyrocketing electric rates we have right now, the high prices at the gas pump, uh, our border not being secure, parental rights and education, election integrity. All of these issues I will be a conservative fighter on. But as I said, I have a long track record of being able to work with people to get great results as well. Mr. Montremani, what are voters getting if they elect you, a partisan fighter or a deal maker? You know, I'd start right away by saying what they're going to get is a representative that takes Granite State interests at heart and takes them down to Washington, D.C. to fight on their behalf. And if that means working across the aisle to get Granite State values implemented, to stop this out of control inflation, to develop an energy policy that makes sense, to turn around and treat China like the threat it is, well, I'm going to work across the aisle to do that then. That's absolutely important. Politics has gotten so divisive that we need to focus on getting things done. I think that the thousands of individuals I've talked to across the Granite State are frankly frustrated by the politics. They're frustrated by the partisanship. What they want is not politics, they want progress. They want their problems solved. They want solutions. They're really tired of all this bickering of one side says one thing, the other side says another thing, and nothing gets done. Mr. Fenton, same question. Yeah, I wouldn't be a, a partisan outsider or a deal maker primarily. I'd be primarily what I've been most of my life, which is a disruptor. And I think that's exactly what we need in Washington, D.C. right now with what they have pulled on us uh, with their increasing tyranny and their uh, economic tyranny. I think we need a disruptor. And primarily it comes down to votes. My votes would be consistently, absolutely no votes against government expansion, against tyranny, against expansion of the tax base and for human rights and freedom. So I would be a disruptor. A great example of that is the filibuster, which is a, a power that you have in the United States Senate. I wanted to see if I could break the record held by Strom Thurmond, uh, which was 24 hours. And I, I made it 33 hours, so I broke the record by nine hours. That's exactly the kind of thing that voters could count on me to do every week if necessary, if it's a matter of rolling back government, decreasing the tyranny, and increasing freedom, putting more power in the hands of the individual in New Hampshire. Next question comes from Gene Mackett. All right, thanks, Adam. The cost of grocery shopping in New Hampshire has grown painful for many Granite Staters. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics says food costs are up almost 11 percent in the past year, the largest one-year increase since 1979. We know you've been critical of Democrats and their handling of the economy and inflation. But what action can the U.S. Senate take right now to alleviate food costs for Americans? And we will begin with you, Mr. Fenton. The idea that politicians can fix something right now is exactly part of the reason that we have these problems. Politicians are not the solution. That's not an answer a lot of people want to hear, and it's not an answer that a lot of politicians give. But the truth is, it's very easy for them to break things and very difficult for them to fix things because of uh, nth order effects and second order effects. Every time they take an action, you have other effects that are unintended consequences. That is exactly what we've seen now with the economy. The reason that we have high inflation and high grocery prices is because politicians have broken the money. Politicians have printed money from thin air without accountability, with reckless abandon, and that causes the prices to go up. So what we need is a longer term solution to get government out of the money printing business, out of the crony capitalism business, and back to allowing more people to have control of their own money and their own finances with sound economic and sound money policies. 
Mr. Monsharamani? Yes, look, the inflation that's affecting Granite State families, let's call it what it is. It's a tax. It is a tax that's been imposed on the Granite State hardworking families, those on fixed incomes, and it's a tax that's been imposed by government. So let's agree what's caused this problem. Now, to your question as to what can we do about it, I think there's one simple policy shift we can make right away that can help restore some sort of price stability. And that begins with energy policy. We had an energy policy that allowed us to be independent, to share our oil and gas with friends and allies. Today, we are energy dependent on countries that hate us. This is bad for national security. This is bad for uh, economic security. And fundamentally, that bleeds into grocery prices. Because if you think about the price of diesel, diesel drives freight rates in the trucking industry, and everything moved by those trucks is going to be caused more. So inflation is directly related to bad energy policy. That's the first thing to fix. Mr. Smith, what can the U.S. Senate do right now? We got to first identify the problem and how we got there in the first place. We have high inflation and supply chain issues right now because of all of the money that has been pumped uh, into our markets over the last uh, really two years. That's what's caused a lot of it, a lot of the out of control spending. The way you bring inflation down and get the economy going again is number one, you have to stop the spending and have a balanced budget again. I've said, let's go back to the Graham Rudman amendment from the 1980s that called for a balanced budget or else there were gonna be automatic budget cuts every year. Uh, we should make the Trump tax cuts permanent. We should lower the individual income tax rates. We should lower, lower the corporate tax rates. Doing that grows the economic pie. You'll get more revenue that way. I've called for a repeal of the Jones Act, which puts higher costs on transporting uh, liquefied natural gas and oil around the country. And also, we have to cut back a lot of the EPA regulations, which stifle development and stifle in investments uh, in more energy production. To you now, Senator Morse. Sure, stop the spending and stop the borrowing. You know, that's the way we can make this work. President Biden, Maggie Hassan, they don't get that message. They don't understand that inflation in June at 9.5%, inflation in July at 8.5%, inflation this past month at over 8%. That's costing the New Hampshire taxpayers one week, one month's salary just to pay for that inflation tax. We need to stop that spending. We need to get back to an energy policy that makes us energy independent so we can ship across this country. We need to make sure that the government gets out of our way. That's the way we do things. We've done it here in New Hampshire. We can do it in Washington, doing it the 603 way. And your thoughts, General Bulldog? Well, thank you very much. And I would uh, answer your question very quickly this way. I would say that we need to reverse energy policies that have got us in this position. Listen, Granite Staters have a lot of common sense. You know, they can, they can add one, you know, one plus one equals two. And what they saw is an administration with the help, 100% help of Maggie Hassan, reverse our energy independence to energy dependence. And immediately the inflation went up. So that's step number one. In the process, we got to lower taxes. We got to balance the budget. They haven't, had, they haven't had a budget in on time since 2006. And they haven't had a balanced budget since the Clinton era. This is, this is, you know, tantamount to a crime as far as I'm concerned. It's Republicans and Democrats. I'm the outsider with the common sense necessary to say, you got too much money going out, not enough money coming in, we got a big problem. We need to balance that. It's not rocket science. It's very, very easy, and I will fight for Grand Staters to get that done. Next question comes from Steve Batari. For a couple of years now, Americans have experienced a new stress when shopping. Empty shelves. We become accustomed to hearing that Supply chain issues mean choices have been diminished and prices have now skyrocketed from the basic household supplies like toilet paper to semiconductor chips for everything from phones to cars. And again, we want to look forward here at solutions. So what can be done right now to repair the supply chain and restore confidence that consumers will find what they need? Mr. Mancharamani, to you first. Certainly. Thank you for the question. Uh, supply chain disruptions are a major problem. They, in fact, are causing lots of problems, not just empty shelves. They're causing higher prices. They're causing disruptions in the availability of goods and services that compound throughout our entire society. We know that, for instance, the shortage of semiconductor chips has actually caused disruptions in the production of auto vehicles and other manufactured goods that these chips go into. So this is a big problem. Step one. 
We need to reduce our dependence on China. China is a strategic threat to our way of life. They have a set of values that differs from the American set of values, and therefore we should not be dependent upon them at all, whether it's for semiconductor chips, whether it's for active pharmaceutical ingredients, whether it's for rare earth materials or anything. We need to develop resilience here at home. In fact, you know, my parents were immigrants from India, and one of the things my dad said was, you know, I left a country that had empty shelves. I'm disappointed to be in a country where we have empty shelves. Mr. Smith, same question. Yeah, well, again, a lot of our supply chain issue is because of the money, the printed money that flooded the markets uh, in which there was more demand uh, than what, uh, what companies could keep up with. But a lot of this goes back to not being energy uh, independent either because that drives uh, a lot of the costs and the supply chain issues as well. I've put forward a comprehensive energy independence plan, uh, number one, because we were energy independent just uh, a year and a half ago and we're not anymore. But number one, we need an all of the above approach uh, to energy. I would say we should be looking at uh, nuclear energy as well. Let's restart the Keystone Pipeline. You know, let's take the suspensions off of publicly leased land. Let's open up all of the permits, uh, not just a third of them. You know, we can't make the transition overnight to green energy, which is exactly what Joe Biden and Maggie Hassan are trying to do right now. That's why we have uh, high gas prices as well. And they don't have an answer for it because they don't want, they want to give up on fossil fuels altogether. And that is the wrong approach. We need to be energy independent in order to bring down inflation and help with those supply chain issues. Mr. Fenton, how do we fix the supply chain? Well, the best thing the government can do is, is get out of the way and more importantly, recognize, <coughs> excuse me, the grave errors that we made with the failed COVID policies. We locked down most of our country. We locked down millions of people and businesses and actions have consequences. This was an unprecedented action done by government officials and uh, it had unprecedented second order effects that they should have predicted. Uh, you, you can't tinker with something as complex as the supply chain and the global economy and our nation's economy without having consequences. So with without much thinking, and we haven't even had an, a reckoning for what has happened, they shut down our entire country, and that caused a lot of problems. So what we need to do is limit government power, get them out of our lives, let the people who understand the supply chain best, which is those people working in it, make market solutions to fix the problem. That's the best solution, not, not politicians in centralized offices. General Bulldog, to you next on this. Well, thank you. So, listen, this is very closely nested to the last question, right? I mean. We got to we got to become energy independent. So we have to reverse energy policies. We got to stop the spending. We got to close our borders. We got to stop spending millions and billions of dollars on an open border in an immigration system that's not working, right? Maggie Hassan sits on the supply chain committee, right? It's broken. It's broken because of special interests, lobbyists, and rich political elite that own Washington D.C. on both sides of the aisle, but more importantly, own her. And as a result. All decisions are made, hurt Granite Staters and the American people. That's the biggest problem. The biggest problem is beholden career politicians that manage a system for other people at our expense. And we need, you need someone down there that's going to stop that. And that is me. And Maggie Hassan sits on this committee as well as other committees like the Oversight Committee, right? I mean, these, these things, what oversight? We don't have any. We need change. Senator Morris. We need to cut the taxes. Right? America is just out of control. Joe Biden wants to make our corporate taxes the highest in the world. We need to go in the opposite direction. We did that right here in New Hampshire. We cut taxes. We built a strong economy. That's what we need to do. We need to make ourselves energy independent again. We were there a year and nine months ago. Let's start drilling. Let's create supply. You know, let's make sure that natural gas can get into our region so that we're not driving up electric rates in this region. I mean, Maggie Hassan's done nothing to make sure we get supply up here in New Hampshire, and we need to go down and fight for that and create a great economy, just like we have here in New Hampshire. Next question coming from the moderator here. Uh, gentlemen, according to a Washington Post article from this week, some of the documents seized at former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home detail top secret U.S. operations so closely guarded that many senior national security officials are kept in the dark about them. There's been a lot of criticism by Republicans, including some here on this stage, that the FBI and the Justice Department are acting politically in this case. Separate from that criticism, should a former president or any government official who has the access ever have this type of highly sensitive information 
at their house. Senator Morse. Yeah, well, I think you're missing the point here, Adam. The point is we've politicized the process with the AG, the FBI. Um, we've, we've gone after a former president in a way that everybody now is talking about things that they hear on TV. It's not the way to run a country. We need to investigate the management of both of those divisions in this country and find out why they're handling themselves this way. I mean, we got real problems in this country. We got people crossing the border that are committing crimes and we don't seem to be prosecuting any of them. We have people that are burning down cities and we don't seem to be prosecuting any of them. I think everybody should be afforded due process in this country and we should start by making sure our government runs appropriately, and that's what I'll do when I get to Washington. But should a former president have these kinds of documents in their private residence? I think that'll play itself out during the due process part of this. I think what the Biden administration has done by politicizing this is absolutely wrong. General Bolduc, we would presume you handled a lot of sensitive information during your time as a general in your years of service and that you understand the importance of protecting these kinds of secrets. Does that kind of information ever belong in an unsecure location? Well, look, no classified material belongs in an unsecured area, and I think we can all agree with that, but we just don't have enough information. Uh, look, look how they handle it. Department of Justice handled this terribly. President Biden handled this ter terribly. I don't care what former president it is. I don't care if it's, it's Obama, if it's, if it's uh, you know, Bush, uh, if it's Clinton. It really doesn't matter much to me. Uh, we should have been notified. We should have been told what they were doing. There should have been transparency in exactly what happened, and there'd be less questions. But now it's, you know, all these lawyer tricks and all this other stuff, so we really don't know. Yes, I have experience with classified material. No, I would say it doesn't need to be uh, left unguarded in any circumstance, but I'm not familiar enough with the policies of a former president and how they're able to take classified material and what they do with it, whether they're in office or out of office. So we just don't know, and we're going to find out, and we need to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, due process. Mr. Fenton. Yes, I am concerned about the potential of the FBI and Department of Justice being used politically. And I think that should concern every American, uh, Republicans and Democrats, because if the concern is there, then it should be a concern of all of ours. As far as the uh, reasoning for having these documents, I don't know enough about the situation to know whether uh, he should have the documents or not. It's a very, very complex thing. Uh, presidents have the ability to declassify documents, for example. There's a great deal of documents. So I think that there's two sides to every story, and certainly I would want to hear his defense uh, before making any, any judgment. You know, uh, there's, a book in, it, there's a book called Three Felonies a Day that estimates that an average business person in the United States commits three felonies a day. That's a big problem. The United States government can pretty, pretty much pick any of us on this stage or anybody else that gets on the wrong side of a certain politician, and they can find something to go after them. We, we should all be concerned that that would not happen to a former president or anyone else. We should have a very, very high bar for justice in the United States of America. Mr. Munshir Armani. Yes, Adam, so let me begin by answering your question. I don't believe confidential documents should be left in any unsecure place. And I do not believe a president is above the law. I think everyone, this is a country of laws and we should adhere to them, everyone, including former presidents. Now, with that said, we have a problem if in fact we have politicized institutions. There's no room for that in a democracy where we should have faith in institutions. Everything from the Justice Department to the FBI to law enforcement, we need to have faith that these institutions are run without partisan dynamics at work. We need to make sure that they are achieving the objectives of the institution. We also need to understand that my guess is most of the FBI, most of the law enforcement professionals, most of the Department of Justice are probably hardworking individuals trying to do the job, trying to do what's right, trying to uphold, uphold the law. So. Yes, we need to learn more, but no, I don't think confidential documents should be left in any unsecure place, regardless of whether it's a president. A president is not above the law. Finally to you, Mr. Smith. Yeah, look, I think the American people do deserve to know why those documents were there, and I'm sure we'll get that in due time. 
But the reality right now is that this, the way they went about doing this was really unprecedented and unheard of uh, by raiding the home of a, of a former president. Uh, we have an FBI right now that has been weaponized and politicized. And all I can say is, thank God Merrick Garland is not currently uh, sitting on the Supreme Court. I mean, think about how political the FBI has become just since 2016, when you had the, the phony Russia collusion uh, events. You had the fraudulent FISA applications. You had the FBI going after parents who were going to school board meetings for being domestic terrorists. I mean, this is just wrong, and it shouldn't be happening in the United States of America. Remember, James Comey told us that Hillary Clinton had tens of thousands of classified emails on her laptop. She bleached them, and it was compromised by the Chinese government. But we didn't raid the home of Bill and Hillary Clinton. So this has to stop, and that's why I've called for a full investigation of the top senior management at DOJ and the FBI. My opponent, General Bolduc, has called for uh, the FBI to be abolished. I don't think that is necessary, but we do need to have a full investigation. General, you've been invoked. You get 30 seconds. Well, thank you very much. Um, once again, um, I appreciate the opportunity, but uh, you know, my words have been clear. We need to look into the Department of Justice and the FBI at the highest levels, and we need to look at it. We need to call them in to the Senate. We don't need a task force. We don't need some special commission. We need to call them in, and we need to interrogate them or interview them and we need to figure out whether they should keep their confirmation and if we come to the uh, understanding that they shouldn't then we terminate their confirmation next question comes from gene mackin a lot of voters are looking for some clarification on the exact position their elected officials have on abortion now that the supreme court has overturned roe versus wade Mr. Smith, let's start with you. You've said that the Supreme Court has now returned this issue to the states, but Congress could still take action. If a vote came to the Senate floor to ban abortion at six weeks, would you vote for it? Well, I appreciate the question. Look, I am pro-life uh, and I'm proud of my pro-life record. As I mentioned, uh, while I was in the New Hampshire House, I was named the pro-life uh, House Member of the Year. Uh, look, as United States Senator, uh, I'd have to look at all legislation carefully, and I'm not going to make comments on any hypothetical pieces of legislation. I do believe the Supreme Court got this decision right with the Dobbs decision and sending this matter back to the states so that the people through their legislators can have a say in this matter, and New Hampshire can handle it the New Hampshire way. Here's what I don't agree with, though, and that is Maggie Hassan's extreme and radical position on this issue. Maggie Hassan's position, and she has voted on this, is she believes in abortion through nine months with no limitations and no restrictions at the taxpayer expense. Even most pro-choice Granite Staters don't have a position that extreme. And I believe that's vastly out of touch with most people in New Hampshire. Senator Morse, before the Supreme Court announced its decision, you said if you were in the U.S. Senate, you would bring New Hampshire's 24-week abortion ban to Washington, but now you're saying this is strictly a state issue. So please, let's make it clear right here tonight. Are you saying you would vote no on any federal abortion legislation based on your belief that it's a state issue? Well, I think you got it right, Gene, the way you phrased the question. Before they acted in Washington in the courts, um, I would have supported Washington making a decision. Now that the courts have acted, I think they should, that we should legislate this in the states. And that's exactly what we did here in New Hampshire. We banned abortion in New Hampshire in the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth month. And we made it perfectly clear that you couldn't use taxpayer dollars in New Hampshire um, to pay for abortions. That's where we should be. We shouldn't be going and doing what Maggie Hassan is saying, and abortions can happen on demand, and they'll be paid for with your tax dollars, and we're going to take parents out of the equation. That's wrong for this state. To you now, Mr. Fenton, you have strong libertarian values. Do you think the government should be involved in regulating abortion at all on either a state or a federal level? And can you tell us why or why not? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> Uh, definitely not at the federal level. I'm running for federal office, and I, I think we should reduce uh, government involvement at, at a federal level uh, in everything. So I would, I would vote no on any uh, abortion laws uh, at, at a federal level, uh, any kind of ban or anything like that. And I, I think this is a very um, divisive wedge issue that's, that's used um, a lot, and a lot of people feel like they're going to lose rights from it. Uh, I personally don't want to take anybody's rights. I want government out of your life. 
And I don't want people to feel that they should be afraid that we're going to take their rights. Uh, I personally don't want to take people's rights. I want people to have their own freedoms and, their, and make their own individual choices with their doctor and, and themselves. I, and I don't want government involved. Mr. Moncharamani, you believe states should have the right to govern policy. Is it fair to women that one state is allowed to make such a consequential procedure illegal while another state allows it? Sure. So first of all, let me begin by saying I do think the New Hampshire policy is the correct policy, that we should have a situation. And I agree with uh, with Senator Chuck Morse that we should allow choice, as he has provided in the first six months, um, and then a ban thereafter. That is a sound policy. This is an issue that is so divisive across America. And I would tell you it's divisive among politicians, not among the population. Most of the Granite State families I've talked to, the Granite State women and Granite State families in total, uh, suggest that they agree with the policy we have here in New Hampshire. Now, when it comes to federal legislation thereof, I would be comfortable if federal legislation was about to impose a difference on New Hampshire families, I would protect New Hampshire's perspective. So I am happy to protect, even if it does require at the federal level, the protection of the New Hampshire law. The New Hampshire law is an appropriate law. It's one that meets the needs of most of the families. It's not perfect, but it's good, and it actually moves the country forward. And General Bolduck, you too have said that this should be up to the states to decide. But as someone strongly pro-life, like you said, would you like to see abortion banned in all 50 states? Listen, I want to protect life from the beginning to the end. I think that's what our health care system is all about, and that's what I think we should be all about. But that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is the extremism of Maggie Hassan, right? There is a solid New Hampshire law here. There's a solid New Hampshire law that allows cho a choice up to six months. And then after that, it forbids it, except for the health of the mother, if, if anything should emerge. That's what a majority of Granite Staters want. That is what Granite Staters want. And she serves Granite Staters. And you know what? I never hear anybody, anybody, ask her what she would do to concede in any way on this issue. All she does is throw fire or throw fuel on the fire. All she does is create discontent, which, which results in violence, which results in vandalism, which results in people not getting along and hating each other. That's not a leader. We don't need her as a United States senator. It's not right, and that's why I'm running. Gentlemen, just to get some final clarity on this, let's just say New Hampshire's abortion ban at 24 weeks comes to the floor of the U.S. Senate. Are you voting yes or no, General Bolduc? Can you say that again? I'm sorry. New Hampshire's 24-week abortion ban mm -hmm. comes to the floor of the U.S. Senate, and you're in the Senate. Are you voting yes or no? If it comes, if the New Hampshire so ban... The New Hampshire's 24-week abortion ban right. is introduced in the, in the U.S. Senate, and it comes to the floor, are you voting yes or no? I don't think that question makes any sense to me. It's already a law here in the state of New Hampshire. It's already been, it's already been decided upon. The Supreme Court made the right decision, the state made the right choice, and boom. So this is federal so legislation, we don't, we don't need essentially. To. So you don't want to answer the question, essentially. It's coming to the floor of the U.S. Senate. Same thing. A bill with which you're familiar. It's hypothetical. I'm not going to comment. Mr. Smith. I don't know what's unclear about it for Don. Yes, I would support that. Yes, I would support it. I was the one that worked hard to pass that law in New Hampshire. Mr. Fenton? I'd vote no. And Mr. Monshire, money. I would vote yes in favor of the ban only if it was accompanied by, a, by also a, a guarantee of choice for the first six months. All right, let's uh, shake things up with a little bit of a lightning round here. Uh, these are actually some tougher questions that we're going to wedge into the lightning round. 15 second answers, though, so you've really got to strike fast here. Uh, Mr. Mansur Armani, uh, would you support a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants as part of a larger deal to secure the border? Uh, as part of a larger deal to secure the border, I would pa come up with a pathway only if it involved some penalties for those who are here. You can't get in line faster than those who come in legally. Mr. Fenton. <clears throat> Yes, I would support it, provided that they uh, do not get an advantage over other people who are already uh, ahead of them. I, I, maybe an idea like have them leave and then come back properly, but make it easier for them to come back properly. Senator Morse. Yeah. No, I believe that we should make sure that we end catch and release, we build the wall, and we follow the laws that we have already in place in this country today. 
Mr. Smith. I cannot support a pathway to citizenship for anyone who came here illegally, although we do need to bring them out of the shadows, so we'd have to look for some other legal mechanism to do that. But the first starter is we have to secure our border, number one, before there's any deal on the table. And General Bullock. I would not support it, and I would not support it because we need to close our border. We need to, we need to enforce legal immigration, and we need to follow those processes. No one's above the law. That includes immigrants. All right, and next question, starting with you, General Bullock. If Republicans control the U.S. Senate next year and there is a Supreme Court vacancy, would you allow President Biden to fill it? Yes or no? Well, I've been clear on this, uh, you know, many times. I want to look, I want to talk to the nominee, which I will have the opportunity to do as a senator. I want to look at their character and integrity. I want to look at their performance on the bench. I want to know how they feel about our Bill of Rights, our First Amendment, Second Amendment. I want to know what, how, they, how they feel on life, and, and I will give them a, you know, the best look I can, but I have my principles, which Granite Staters send me down there to, uh, to follow. But you would support a vote on the floor? I would. Okay. Mr. Smith. Sure, he can bring someone forward. It doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to vote yes, though, on that nominee. I'm going to be looking for a nominee uh, who has a strict constitutionalist philosophy, someone in the mold of uh, Antonin Scalia. Senator Morse. Yeah, I honestly believe that there's a test there that needs to happen at any point in time. I believe they have to obviously be qualified. They have to have a past that we can read and understand and make sure that they follow the Constitution in this country and not make up things that they want to put in place at that point in time. I, I don't think we need to be politically correct. I think we need to make them follow a process. But a nominee in 2023 should get a vote on the floor. We could take a vote on the floor when we interview them. Mr. Fenton. Yes, uh, it, it's part of our constitutional obligation to, I, I think, have those kind of votes. It's also part of our constitutional right to, to oppose, and there's quite a bit that we can do to uh, delay or, or completely uh, cancel bad nominations. Mr. Monsharamani. Absolutely. Of course we take a vote on it. Of course, dependent upon the, the quality and character of the, the nominee, but why wouldn't we? Okay. Next question, starting with Mr. Fenton. Do you believe the Earth is warming at a worrisome pace? I don't know enough about it to, to know, and, and I think that uh, there's a lot of people that are in that same category who are saying otherwise. Um, I, I think that the metric of temperature is concerning to me, especially because I, I, I spent a lot of my, type, my, my life very concerned about pollution, and we now have huge, huge, huge polluters, members of the World Economic Forum, other governments, our own government, our own military, who are, I'm sorry, I, re I realize this is a shorter question. <laughs> <It's just> a <laughs> lightning round. <laughs> sorry about it's that. It's a big one, but a quick one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Morse. Um, no, I don't think I know enough about it to be able to give you a yes, no answer on that process. But I can tell you this, I think the way that's being politicized in this country right now is absolutely wrong. Mr. Smith, do you believe the earth is warming at a worrisome pace? Well, I believe uh, climate change is happening, but I also believe it's scientifically cyclical uh, as well. And right now it's being used as to politicize it, uh, to shove through socialist policies uh, like the Green New Deal. And frankly, that's just wrong. General Bullock. The climate changes. That's a fact. It's common sense. You don't need to be a scientist to figure that out. We need to act responsibly, and we will act responsibly. The problem we have is China, Russia, North Korea, Iran are the biggest polluters in the world, and no one's saying anything about them. They're always pointing at us, and the United States leads the way on this. That's where we need to look at this. Mr. Manjaramani. Yes, the climate is definitely changing, Adam. Uh, I think the problem is in our reaction function to that change. We need to stop the climate alarmism and actually develop reasonable, common-sense solutions that don't penalize Granite State families. All right. The Senate is expected to vote in the coming weeks on a bill that would codify same-sex marriage into federal law. Would you vote for it? Yes or no, Mr. Smith? I could support it so long as there were protections in there for relig uh, religious liberty uh, and religious freedom. General Bullock? Well, again, New Hampshire's figured this one out, too, back in 2010, and it hasn't been a problem, and they're trying to politicize something that's not a problem. I commanded same-sex uh, partners in my command as a general officer and we treated them with respect honor they did their job and there hasn't been a problem where this problem is people are put, putting fuel on the fire to create problems where there isn't New Hampshire has led the way on this just like it's leading the way on abortion Senator Morse yes Mr. Fenton 
Yeah, I support any anybody's uh, right, right, but I don't think government is always the solution. I'd rather have government entirely out of the, the marriage business, but I do support anyone's right to uh, marry anybody they want. All right, Mr. Munch, money. Certainly, yes, I would support that. Let's go next to Steve Botari. Adam, thanks. We are more than six months into the Russian invasion of Ukraine at this point, and there is no indication it'll let up anytime soon. At this point in the conflict, the question is, has the U.S. done everything it can do, or what else would you push for if elected? More humanitarian aid, more weapon systems, or nothing at all? Mr. Fenton, to you first. Yes, uh, I, I definitely wouldn't do more. We've already done too much. Our foreign policy for many years has been characterized by meddling in uh, the affairs of other nations. I don't think this is our affair, and I don't think it's constitutional to involve ourselves. I personally uh, don't trust the information that we're getting from the media, and I don't trust uh, Zelensky or, or the Ukrainian government. Um, but I may be wrong, and, and that's fine. Every individual and everybody in America should have the right, if they think that it's a worthy cause, they should have the right to send their own money. But nobody should be uh, forced to, to have their hard-earned wages sent to a cause that they may disagree with. Mr. Smith? Yeah, so, uh, look, we've been leading from behind uh, as a country in this particular area. Uh, we cannot allow Putin and the Kremlin to win this war. Uh, and notice I said Putin and the Kremlin and not the Russian people. I believe they have just a bad actor and a dictator right now leading their country. Um, we can't let them win this war uh, because of their strategic position they will have to export gas and oil. Uh, to the rest of the world, and also because it sends a signal to other rogue states that if they have the military might, they can take over countries as well. At the same time, I don't believe in sending endless amounts of money to Ukraine either. Uh, that goes completely unaccounted for. Uh, I do believe in giving them the equipment they need and the training they need to fight this war themselves. I do not believe in having boots on the ground there. Um, but at the same time, we do have uh, an outside interest in this and in making sure that uh, uh, Putin doesn't win this. But this is all due to the feckless leadership, foreign policy leadership of, of Joe Biden, from the Afghanistan debacle withdrawal to leading from behind in Ukraine. We have to go back to having peace through strength, which is what we had under the Trump administration. General Bullock. We have no policy and strategy, and that's, you know, the essence of all this, right? We were too late to react. And so the Ukraine got invaded. We lost our vote because of the Afghanistan debacle. Since then, China, North Korea, and Iran have expanded. We have no foreign policy that's working. Our diplomacy is weak. Our information operations is terrible. Our military is marginally capable of doing its job. Our political apparatus is dysfunctional. And our economy is a shambles. We need a strong America. And the only way we're going to be effective overseas, the only way that we can do anything overseas, is by having a strong America. So we need to focus on America first, and then we can focus on these other areas. Until then, no, no policy, no strategy, no support. That's it. We owe that to the American people and to the men and women that we serve, we send into harm's way. I know a little bit of something about that. For Ukraine, more humanitarian aid, more weapon systems, or nothing at all? Senator Morse. Yeah, this question is truly about leadership, and we're not showing any in this country. I mean, we have an energy policy where we depend on countries like Russia and Venezuela and OPEC nations. I mean, President, um, the President Biden has just sent this all out and said we're not going to be energy independent in this country. Um, that's wrong. We heard from Judd Gregg, who said, true leadership would be to have an energy policy that makes us energy independent in the United States. And let's lead from that. Let's close the border and lead for some strength there and not let illegals come into this country. And obviously, I, I think on the spending end of anything, we need to get a handle on this. We should know where every dollar is going in this country, and we certainly shouldn't be borrowing to do that. Mr. Montremarni. Yeah, look, I think we need to start with an understanding as to how we got here. And we got here because of American weakness. It started in the Obama administration, the Obama-Biden administration. Let's correct myself here. Sorry. Uh, it was weakness. Russia took Crimea. What did we do? Nothing. The Chinese went and took the South China Sea and militarized islands. What did we do? Nothing. The Syria, uh, we had a red line in Syria. Russia, Syria crossed that red line. What did we do? Nothing. And then we had Afghanistan, the disastrous withdrawal. And so 
so in this world, America telegraphed weakness. And when we telegraph weakness, our enemies take advantage. Instead, when we telegraph strength, we will get them to take notice as to what we're doing. And so to answer your question directly, we should continue to support the Ukrainians, but we should not put boots on the ground. We should give them, with proper oversight, support in the form of military arms and training if necessary. The bigger threat that we all have to keep on our, uh, on our radar is China. China is a strategic threat to our way of life, and we have to pay attention to them. Telegraphing strength will help us do that. Gentlemen, you've all spoken out about wanting to reduce the size of the federal government. We'd like to get a little bit more specific. What exactly does reducing the size mean? Are you talking about limit, eliminating entire departments? A 30-second answer this time, and Mr. Manshar Armani, we're going to start with you. Sure, Adam, I'm in favor of reducing the size of the government wherever and however possible. I think an across-the-board cut would be potent potentially very easier to get done, but there are departments that I'm not sure what they do. Hey, look, the Department of Agriculture, 70% of the folks there are, uh, are forest rangers. We can take them, put them in the Department of Interior. 70% of the budget is uh, food stamps or the SNAP program. We can put that in health and human services. We can reorganize and create efficiency. I'm a business guy, not a politician. When I look at this, this is bureaucratic bloat and we can contain it. Mr. Smith. Yeah, we have to get a lot more efficient as a federal government because we're not efficient at all right now. You know, I know some of the biggest costs we have in the federal government are personnel costs. And I've said that any position that isn't filled in the federal government after six months ought to be eliminated. But we do have to take a look at agencies as well and ask about what is their effectiveness. The Department of Education would be a good place to start. Is the Department of Education really all of that effective anymore for the states and localities? Or are they just causing more problems? Department of Energy is another one, and I'd like to take a cl close look at both of those departments. Mr. Fenton. Yeah, I'd like to cut almost all of them. I'd like to cut everything across the board. Uh, EPA, the Department of Education, Department of Energy, Department of Agriculture, the DHS, uh, you could go on and on. Government is far, far, far too large. It's far too invasive in our lives. And the money that is spent to uh, su support all of this waste is taken from the workers, from the workers and the wages and the middle class and everybody else in America. We've got to return that money to the people and uh, ha have the private markets solve a lot of these uh, issues because government usually makes it worse, not better. Senator Morse. Yeah, if we can do it better in the states, I think that's where we should be taking care of things. The Department of Education is a prime example. I think we do it better here in New Hampshire. I think that's where we should be operating out of. You know, we've proven in New Hampshire that we can live within our means without a sales tax, without an income tax, and we can still provide for the people in this state. Let's take that to Washington, and let's get Washington to understand what New Hampshire is doing. General Bullock. So to answer your question here, uh, yeah, EPA, Education Department, Energy, Homeland Security, Department of Labor, the VA, not doing its job, and the Department of Defense. And I know personally, Department of Defense needs some serious reform. All right, next question from Gene Mackin. All right, thank you, Adam. A Gallup poll that came out in July shows that only 7% of Americans have a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in Congress. It's easy to be on stage and say that's just because of the status quo. But no matter who's in control of the House and Senate come 2023, it's safe to say confidence isn't going to skyrocket. How would you seek to rebuild that confidence or are we beyond the point of it even mattering anymore? We'll start with you, Mr. Smith. Well, sure. <clears throat> Look at if we are fortunate enough to take back the majorities in the House and Senate uh, in January, uh, we can't just be the party of no. Yes, we're going down to make sure that Joe Biden's uh, socialist agenda doesn't go any further. But at the same time, we have to cast a very positive and forward-looking uh, vision as well, which is the things that I've been talking about to Granite Staters uh, for the last nine months. It's how do we bring down electric rates? How do we bring down the cost of home heating oil? How do we bring down the price of gas by becoming uh, energy independent as well? You know, people are very concerned about our border that's not secure right now because of all of the drugs that have flowed uh, all across the country and right here into New Hampshire. We had a tragic death of a toddler in Londonderry on an overdose of fentanyl. So that's a concern. It's again, uh, restoring parental rights and education as well. So we have to present this forward-looking vision uh, to the people of New Hampshire and go down with a plan. And I've got a lot of plans. Senator Morse. Yeah, I think we need to do this one exactly like we do in New Hampshire. I, I think we have to make it very clear that the people in our state, 424 legislators and a governor, 
um, get to talk to the legislature. When has Maggie Hassan come back to the state and talk to the people? When has she held a press conference in this state to talk to the people? I really do think that's how you make for a better government and you get people to really care about it and want to be involved. They want to know you're listening. That's not what's happening in Washington. Washington's doing it the Washington, D.C. way, not our way. I think we need to get back to that in this state and in this country, and it'll work. I, I'm very positive about the fact that we can make change by having the 51st vote in the nation be a Republican senator. Mr. Monsharamani, your thoughts on this issue? Certainly. Uh, look, we need to start focusing on solving problems. That will restore faith in Congress and elected officials. Right now, we're compounding problems. This recent Inflation Reduction Act, it's comical to even call it that. It's going to increase inflation by increasing spending. We need to stop that. We need to focus on solutions. That's what everyone wants to hear. They want to know how we're going to get energy independent. They want to know how we're going to actually secure the border. They want to know how we're going to actually fix the immigration system. We need to be positive, forward-looking, restore equality of opportunity, not, e not equity of outcomes. We've gotten to a place where we're effectively rewarding irresponsible behavior. The student loan bailout is one example thereof. There's a lot of these examples. And individuals, voters around the country know that. That's why we don't have confidence in Congress, because they're failing us. We need to change them out. They're also, they're hanging on for too long. They're all career politicians. We need to send business people and people from outside, uh, outsiders down there to shake it up and make it work better. General Bolduc, how do you restore American confidence? Well, the number one problem that Granite Staters articulate to me everywhere I go is this, inflation. And they're not going to be able to think about anything else until their representative down there does his job and lowers the prices of food and energy. This is what's important. I've held mother's hands. I've hugged fathers. I've looked at grandparents. I've looked at retirees that are upset they have to go out and get another job. It's about leadership, accountability, responsibility, transparency, and truth. Something we don't get from Maggie Hassan. Something we haven't got from, from her for five and a half years. She's only increased our spending. She's hurt Granite Staters across the board. Granite Staters aren't going to think about anything else until they can take care of their house, their children, their livelihood, their children's futures. This is what matters to them, and that's what they want, and that's what I'll give them. And let's hear from you, Mr. Fenton. Yeah, so the question is, uh, there's 7% confidence in Congress. How can we increase that? Uh, I, I think it's great that it's only 7%. I'd like to decrease it down to 0%. Politicians are not the answer. Politicians are not the solution. Nobody should have any faith in, in, in Congress. Uh, because they are not the solution. The fact that there's 7% shows that 7% are uh, people are still fooled. They're fooled by a vision that politicians in fancy offices paid for with money that they stole from them can somehow fix their ills. They can't. The solution is in yourself. The solution is within you. Individuals should be empowered. You should have more power. You should be able to make good decisions, make good decisions about the loans, the business things that you do, what, you, what decisions you make in life. Don't look to politicians in fancy offices in Washington, D.C. to make your life better. They're going to make your life worse. You shouldn't trust them. You're right. If you're in the if you're in this, the uh, the 93 percent that doesn't trust them, you're on the right track. Keep it up. We've reached the point of the debate where it's time for closing statements, and the first one goes to General Don Bolduc. Thank you very much, Grand Staters. My name is Don Bolduc. As you know, I'm running for the United States Senate. I've been campaigning for two years now. Over these two years, I've visited every town and city. I know you're hurting. I share it with you. I know you're paying too much money for everything. I will go to Washington, D.C. as your ambassador to work hard to change this. I will give you a voice, a voice that you do not have now. And as we move forward together, we the people, we will make a difference. I will support you. You can count on me. You can't count on Maggie Hassan. She hasn't been able to deliver for you for five and a half years. I humbly and respectfully ask for your vote on 13 September so that I can go in to the general election and beat Maggie Hassan and take care of you, your children, and your grandchildren. God, God bless you, God bless America, and live free or die. Next closing statement from Vikram Mansharamani. Thank you, Adam, and thank you to all of those who have tuned in this evening. Uh, let me tell you how I see this race. 
Uh, we've heard that Kevin's been running for office since he was 19. Uh, we've heard that Chuck's been running for office since I was 19. Uh, look, I haven't been running for office for the last 30 years. I've been running businesses. I'm the son of immigrants. I've gone from pumping gas at my dad's station to advising Fortune 500 companies. The career politicians have broken this economy. They have bankrupted this country and they're brainwashing our kids. Enough is enough. It's time to send an outsider, send me an outsider with fresh ideas down to Washington to fix this mess. We need to restore the American dream. And that means the American promise of equal opportunity, not equal outcomes. That also means understanding the promises that hard work will matter. And ultimately a promise that America's future and is brighter, the better days are ahead of us. Look, Maggie Hassan and the career politicians have broken this country. It's time to send a businessman down to D.C. to fix it. I humbly ask for your vote. Let's not send another politician to D.C. Let's send a businessman. Closing statement from Bruce Fenton. Yeah, I'm all about freedom. You know, I, I, I came up with a phrase eight, eight years ago. I said, I want gay married couples to be able to own fully automatic weapons to protect their cannabis plants. I want you to be able to worship how you want. I want you, you to be able to read what you want. I want you to be able to say what you want without being censored by government. I want you to be able to keep your own money. And we are in a place where our country is very, very divided right now. A lot of Americans are not seeing eye to eye with their neighbors. And we may not see eye to eye, but I hope and believe that the one thing we can see eye to eye on is human freedom. To me, that is what the Constitution is all about. It's about the ability for people to make decisions that we may not agree with as Republicans or Democrats. But we've got to be united in freedom and those core principles of human rights and human freedom. It's the only way forward. It's the only way to unify our country. And it's the only way for New Hampshire and America to move forward as a nation. Thank Closing you. Closing statement now from Kevin Smith. Well, let's be clear about what's going on in this election right now. Mitch McConnell has gone all in $4 million for his guy, Chuck Morse, the career politician, the establishment pick. And Chuck Schumer, he's gone all in with millions of dollars for Don Bolduck because we know he's the weakest candidate to take on Maggie Hassan. So if you want six more years of Mitch McConnell, well, vote for Chuck Morse. If you want six more years of Maggie Hassan, vote for Don Bolduck. It reminds me of the song, Clowns to the Left of Me, Jokers to the Right, and Here I Am, Stuck in the Middle with You, the voters, and we're surrounded by the swamp. I am not beholden to the Washington, D.C. elites. I am not bought and paid for by anyone. I'm going down to fight the corruption. As I told you before, I'm a conservative fighter and a fixer as well. I get solutions, I get results, and I know I can beat Maggie Hassan this fall. So Susie and I, we humbly ask for your vote on September the 13th, and together united, we will make our conservative voice matter again in the United States Senate. Thank you very much and God bless. Closing statement now from Senator Morse. Thanks, Adam. And I'd like to thank WMUR for putting this on. I'm Chuck Morse and I'm running for the U.S. Senate. And I'm honored to have the endorsement of Governor Chris Sununu. You know, as Senate President, I worked with the governor to deliver the most conservative budget in the state's history. We cut taxes. We sent over $500 million back to the property taxpayers. And working with the governor, we've done things like pass constitutional carry, pass education freedom accounts so that parents had choice in New Hampshire. We protected the sanctity of life in New Hampshire by banning abortion in the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth month. And I've beaten Maggie Hassan. In 2015, I produced a budget that Maggie Hassan vetoed, and I got it overridden with Republicans and Democrats. I can beat her again in November. I ask for your support on September 13th. Thank you. All right, that does it for us tonight. We'll be back tomorrow night for the Republican candidates for governor in our final Granite State debate of the primary. Thank you to the candidates. Thank you to our panelists and thank you watching at home. Have a great night. <laughs>